Okay. Are we set? I thought we were, but it didn't. It says it's recording. Sheldon, can you hear us? Sheldon, if you can hear us, give us a thumbs up. I can hear you. And it said that is. He can't hear you, so give us a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, he's giving us a thumbs up. Good. Good morning, Sheldon. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I can't see you. Good morning, Sheldon. <laughs> can't see you, but I guess I'll see you during the rabbi's class the next hour. So. <laughs> okay, uh, so today we're discussing Jews in the American labor movement. Um, you could also subtitle that Jews and the left, although we're going to talk about Jews in American politics another time. We will cover some of that today. So, how did Jews become associated with the left and with labor unions? By what? What was their topic? They worked in industries that needed to be unionized, like uh, like the garment industry. Right, except that when the uh, Western Federation Labor Union, AFL, was founded, it was founded in the 1870s. Uh, by Samuel Gompers, and he was a British Jew, actually. Uh, and um, they really didn't want to accept less skilled workers. Okay. Many of the, the Jews who worked in the, the Jews were overwhelmingly represented in the garment industry in New York and elsewhere in Chicago and Philadelphia. That's awesome. The major centers. Jews were the predominant in the labor in the labor garment industry. This had been taken by the end of the 19th century, the 20th century. But the AFL was too enthusiastic about uh, they wanted skilled labor, and garment industry was sort of semi-skilled. Unskilled labor, uh, but the heavy industry, supply uh, industry. Industry, industry was not never going to the AFL. It was the CIO. And that's how it happened. The CIO united the heavy industry. The textile industry was a great industry. Uh, and, uh, but the AFL would be cleaner. Familiar, some Jews. Jews have been proletarian actually, they're becoming proletarian areas in Eastern Europe. Meaning that before that, Jews had been what we would call lower middle class. They had been small shop workers, they had been craftspeople, uh, tailors, uh, whatever. They had skills, but they were not. Um, but they worked for themselves. They were self employed, and their families worked for the living. So, you had whole families who went with the cottage industry, the revolution in the 18th century. There were a lot of cottage industries all over Europe, who were commercial industries too. Um, families were together. Well, by the 19th century, the you have the beginnings of they have machinery. They have textile industry in New England, for example, in the 80s and 30s. And the textile industry, a lot of them were so hard. They got the cars. But the time they were finished with their education, they got the employment. So they get very much. They went and before you married, They live in the towns, but the daughters, by and large, work for their fathers. 
marriage. He went all sorts of things. Now he's Jewish, but he always worked with their husbands. Or part of whatever they do, so but they don't count. Uh, but young girls used to go to uh, work in the factories, and uh, often it was to help their brothers with the English. Uh, that was very typical. And the Jewish girls who would do that in the late 19th century, too. Uh, but they're not going to be working in textile factories. They'll be working in garment factories and other kinds of things. There are other Jewish unions between the Jews and the Jews. But this was a various, various um, garment industry unions where they eventually, in the 1900s, they discovered the garment workers' union. And there's also in other he trades in 1888, which includes people who do house painting and different kinds of crafts, and um, people who work with cigarettes or tobacco. Uh, you know, all these unions uh, and they become part of the United of trades. Uh, and the reason why Jews form their own unions. Well, a couple of reasons, but one of the main ones is because the AFL it was too small scale to be able to. And many, many Jews didn't work in factories anyhow, they worked in sweatshops, which developed in the tenements where Jews lived, the Lower East Side or wherever else they were living. What is a sweatshop? Yeah. Right. Well, they don't make much money. That's for sure. <laughs> that they you know, work them to death. They sweat. <laughs> they sweat. They sweat. They sweat a lot. And that's because they are in tents. They're not in factories. Because there are some factories that are in the 20th century. Trying to serve those factories. For example, which we'll get to a little bit later. Okay, that's the most famous one. But there are lots of other ones. But a sweatshop is generally in an immigrant apartment. Of course, in an immigrant apartment, as we discussed last week, you have not only that the owner and his family living there, you have orders and you have maybe somebody else running a business from this apartment too. Um, but what a sweatshop is, is sort of contract labor. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the sweatshops would get pre cut fabric that wasn't sewn together. Or, uh, or they would cut it themselves. But they put together the garments. And uh, but they, they get a piece of work to begin with, and then they, they, they get paid for bulk of this piece of work or so they can help them. In fact, you get paid for the number of units you make, but the sweatshop you just do the time. I don't know how many people are counting. Uh, but at any rate, you are in these very crowded situations. The, the begin with the owner of the sweatshop is probably an immigrant himself. Who came just a little bit earlier, managed to amass enough money to buy a couple of them. sewing machines. Sewing machines turned out uh, the sewing sewing machine is from the 1880s, but there were apparently the beginnings of sewing machines in this country in the 1850s. Okay, so in order to have a sweatshop, you have to have a certain number of sewing machines. Uh, and eventually they make the workers bring their own sewing machines. And they have to pay to transport them from one place to another. Wow. Workers. So these, the, so the workers work on piece work or on you know, product they produce, but whatever profits are made are made by the owners, who generally don't have much more than the workers, except that they they have the part, they have the tenement, and they have uh, their and they have a couple of sewing machines or what have you, and the work is done in their home. So the workers get paid next to nothing. Of course, men get paid more than women. What else is new? Uh, but this is really major. They get paid more than women. Uh, not that the women, men get paid that much either. Women get paid often uh, half as much as men do, uh, if that much. And um, sometimes, apparently, in these sweatshops, they would, um, they would, the men would hire young girls to do the work for them. And so these are men, these are girls working for the men who are working for the for the, for the owners. So the only one to get anything though is the uh, the owner. 
But the owners generally, are, you know, we tend to know too, and the wives and daughters are probably working in the same sweatshop. Uh, but it's terribly crowded, um, and they are really, really good. They did peace work, and eventually, when you get to the back pieces of the early 20th century, then it really gets well down with this. Like the auto industry. You do this widget, you do this widget, they want the better, you've got four widgets. Shit, this guy, you get the idea. Um, the, in the diamond industry, uh, in the dark diamond business, uh, they, you have cutters and pressers. Those are your TV. Now, at the, at the, at the sewing machines, you are making the actual garments. Uh, and eventually some people will button up with the other So a tailor is So the but the women get paid the least and do and are in the in the field of the actual making of the garments with the pieces that pays the least. They're doing this to help support their family. Most of these women are not happy. They're young girls, sometimes in their early teens, sometimes in their teens. Excellent. That was even worse, but uh, I don't think it's congested. But everything, you know. Girls work there because they need the money to help support their families. Uh, and it's generally the oldest, the older daughters, and that's the real old daughters. Also, sometimes the daughters or their, or their sons will come over to the father to set up the business, and then the younger members of the family will come over. But they often the older daughters come over before they're married and are part of the system. They start to work and get paid very little. Uh, and eventually, by the 20th century, they got factories. Okay, they're not sweatshops anymore. What happens in factories? Mass production. Mm -hmm. No, not quite mass. Now it is mass, yeah. mass. If mass then wasn't quite as big as mass. No. Okay, a factory is. It's a larger space, it's probably in a tenement too, or maybe in a factory building, but it would be a loft, it would be large. Okay. And, um, and you have lots and lots of young girls working there and some men. They're all, all, the boxes are always men in either the sweatshop or in the factories. Um, and often the young women uh, are very um, uh, mistreated, exploited. Still happens to them, but especially in the garment trades. I mean, <coughs> women still don't get paid very much to work on sewing machines. They're often immigrants, right? Do they this day? Different ethnic groups are coming through. Uh, so it's really, it's rather poor working conditions, put it that way. And there was no, uh, there was no labor law in the early 20s. Uh, the factories are pretty new, and the workers are not protected at all. And the women certainly aren't protected from the men, whether it's the, the foreman or the boss or their fellow workers. Women are simply not protected. And often, um, you know, the only option a woman has if she feels that she is being uh, harassed uh, or raped, uh, her only option is leaving a situation. No use complaining. Not to do any good. Because we just sort of assume that that's just what happens in factories. Now, the difference for Jewish, for garment factories, most of them are Jewish owned and most of the workers are Jewish, both the men and the women. Uh, and so it's still explo it's exploitation, but it is exploitation of Jews for other Jews. To begin with, it was German Jews who owned the, the sweatshops or the factories. And then it's Eastern European Jews 
we step in because the it's like in Eastern Europe that generally the person who owns a factory or a sweatshop is someone who came over maybe a decade or two earlier, establishes themselves and have their own place. Okay, so they become the boss. And all the Jews really wanted to do, they really, the Jewish men really wanted to become bosses. They were really not intending to become proletariat because the hope was that they would eventually have enough wherewithal to set up their own sweatshop or eventually factories. Um, and in many cases that did happen. The Jews were not really planning to have multiple generation of workers. So this is really a one or two generation enterprise and Jews sort of go through this as an part of the immigrant experience, especially in large cities. And so in and New York, of course, is the best example and the Lower West Side is the best example of this happening. And but remember from last week that the population of the Lower East Side keeps on shifting. In other words, immigrants stay there for X number of years and then they move to a second area of settlement. And another group of immigrants comes in and takes their jobs. And there's never an end to the people who take their jobs, which is why eventually, um, you know, Jews want to belong to unions and to be able to try to protect themselves and other people in the union from scabs who come in to work when they are striking. Jews learned how to strike, not in this country, but in Europe. And you have a Jewish socialist labor movement that develops in Eastern Europe in the 1870s. Really, I think the first Jewish labor organization was in England, but these were Eastern European Jews who were, who were uh, emigrated to England in the 19th, early 19th century. And, um, and again, in Eastern, in Eastern Europe, it's Overwhelmingly Jews working for other Jews. In Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. not in England, what, what industry were they? Hey, garment. They were in garment there too. They were in. Do you know that? Yeah, no, Jews have been in, uh, in the Shmata business um, <laughs> for a long time because many of them were in, many of them were uh, tailors before, and um, the whole family would have have sewing skills, or they were belt makers. I mean, my, my maiden name was Pass, P-A-S-S. That was a lengthened Polish name. The Polish word, the Slavic word for belt is P-A-S, mm -hmm. which is, a, a, it is a, it is a, it is a there are, in, I found out when I learned Serbian, when I was in former Yugoslavia, um, that my name, uh, I had to be very careful how I pronounce my last name. It might mean something else. Yes. Oh. If it, with a long falling accent, like pass, that's a belt. Mm -hmm. If you say pass, that's a bitch. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my God, how close can you get? <laughs> I had to be very careful to use long falling accents because <laughs> you have in Poland, not necessarily, they are the same two roots there, but, uh, but that's why the name, the family name in Europe was P-A-S. And I checked that in, uh, in, in Polish records. Uh, but when my grandfather in 1905 came to the United States, to Canada actually, um, and um, his boy, his name was Pass, and it was P-A-S-S. So I had all kinds of relatives when I was growing up. There was kicking horse. There was you know, all kinds of. They didn't have a name. There was a slog. <laughs> no, they, no they, I mean, there were probably past witches that became oh. passes too. Okay, but I have a length and post. I had a length and post name, and I didn't want it to be punned on all the time. So when I married Phil, I took his last name. I thought it couldn't be punned on, so it was not quite as easy to be punned on. <laughs> and anyway, oh, so my father's. Family had been tailors in northern Poland, uh, and um, my, my grandfather came over in 1905, and his name was lengthened uh, to P A S S. He became a tailor in Montreal, 
but he had a dome to buy the tailor shop. He wasn't working for them. He was never very well with that. But at any rate, I don't think he worked for anybody else. But to the best of my knowledge, as far as this family story is concerned. But the same thing happens in Montreal as would happen in New York or any place else, that you're likely to be working in the family industry or eventually maybe a, a textile factory. I mean, a garment factory, not textiles. Uh, textiles is almost always in, it starts in New England and then it moves down south. They have, they have big machines. Okay? They've got weaving machines and knitting machines and they have huge things and they need, they need a mill. Uh, you want to support a water source to get for energy and uh, useful. Generally, New England or down south, and that's still where most of the text, in, if, insofar as there's an American textile industry, it would still be in those places. I think they'd be down south by now. Uh, Harriet? A lot of people who worked in um, New England were French Canadians who came down to the United States, or lived in Massachusetts or in Maine, and uh, lots of French speakers. Uh, but uh, the Jews, of course, when they came here, they, of course, were speaking Yiddish. At least the average Jewish worker was speaking Yiddish. So it was very nice for them to be able to work for other Jews who spoke Yiddish. I mean, you come in, you join your Landsmannschaft. Somebody in your Landsmannschaft, or the person you met yesterday, has a sweatshop. They're going to do you a real favor. They're going to hire you <laughs> because you're looking for jobs. And you think, gee whiz, I've got a job, isn't that terrific? And maybe they even provide a sewing machine for you. Uh, uh, so that's the way it happens, that you become an owner, a business owner rather than a worker, uh, almost overnight. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, the reason for the labor unions was because of all of this exploitation of immigrant workers. And they weren't really protected by what, what is on the AFL because the unions were highly discouraged in this country in the 1880s and the 1890s. Still discouraged. Yes, <laughs> until last night. Oh, that's <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Times were changing. Yeah, At right. least yeah. it sounds that way. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> At any rate, um, but you know, under certain administrations, union is not a bad word. And other administrations, you can't belong to a union, they wouldn't want you to organize. I mean, Starbucks, they're allowed to organize. Because they treat the, the, the employees so well that they don't want to organize. Yeah, right. Right. And that, um, but often when places organize, again, the owner of Starbucks, I believe, is Jewish. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, but I don't know. Did you, did you? How many people remember the movie? Um, something Ray. Uh, Norma Ray. Norma Ray. Norma Ray. Norma Ray. Yeah. One of my favorite scenes is when she is saying to the Jewish labor organizer, "Kavetch, Kavetch, Kavetch." <laughs> <laughs> the one Yiddish word she knew well. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate. Um, but at least in the garment industry, by and large, the, uh, the owners, the bosses are uh, Jewish and the workers are Jewish. And um, the unions, for the most part, in the garment industry to begin with, were Jewish unions. Uh, and what makes them Jewish unions? Not only the fact that the workers were Jewish, okay, but the organizers, of course, are also Jewish. Oh. You've got Jewish labor leaders. Now, most of them were socialists. Some of them had come from Europe already socialists, right? Because the social, socialism starts to develop, as I said, in the 1870s, the 1880s. In, in Eastern Europe, you have uh, the beginnings of the, um, what becomes the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party. Uh, they were the populists who were organizing workers, but the populace wanted to go to the people, i.e. go to the peasants and raise their consciousness, okay? They didn't really work among Jews so much until Jews started getting involved and started becoming labor organizers. Uh, and the interesting thing is the labor organizers in Eastern Europe who were going to the people were 
a relatively educated Jews who spoke Russian. They don't only spoke Yiddish. So the early labor organizations organizers in Eastern Europe were Russian-speaking Jews. And they wanted to organize Russian circles in among the workers and use Russian. Now this doesn't go over terribly well with Yiddish-speaking workers, either in Russia or in the United States or in England or wherever you might be. The language of the workers was Yiddish. But to begin with, they wanted to, to educate their workers. And they used Russian. Doesn't go that far, but they tried. Uh, but by the 1890s, you have um, you know, so many Jews became socialists in the 1880s, the 1890s, and they joined the populist movement. Uh, and then they were also the early communists. There weren't any communists, they were socialists. The early socialists in Eastern Europe were, among them, were Jews um, who wanted to help raise the consciousness of the working class. Okay? And at first they do it in Russian, and eventually they'll switch to Yiddish by the 1890s. And the, the, the organization known as the Bund is created. The Bund was created in 1898, I believe, 97, uh, I think it's 38. Uh, and it was the uh, Bund stands for sort of a union or federation of Jewish workers of Poland and Lithuania, known as the Bund. Okay? And firstly, they adopt Yiddish as their language. And they were very much into educating workers. And the labor unions, the Jewish labor unions in this country, especially the garment industry unions, are very much into educating workers. But they eventually, they found that in Europe, the way to educate workers is not to speak to them in Russian, because they don't know Russian, because you speak to them in Yiddish. And the, and the, and the Bundist are Yiddishists. Harriet, when you say educating workers, do you mean educating them just generally or educating them in terms of their trade? Educate, educating them ideologically into become, so that they will become socialists. Okay? Harriet? As, you know, they'll night classes or work, you know, um, or, uh, you know, they want their workers to not be simply local folk who would, would have been peddlers if they, could, if they could earn a living that way, but now they're going to become uh, garment workers um, and you know they work on short sewing machines that sort of so thing. to empower them yeah they want to empower them to uh, to raise their consciousness so that they'll want to be proud workers and not proud owners <laughs> uh, Harriet <laughs> always work <laughs> but you do succeed in some cases with younger people uh, you know teenagers who get involved in socialist movement these are in, these are these become Jewish intellectuals. But before, Jewish intellectuals, intellectuals used to be yeshiva bookers. Okay, they were the educated Jews, and they were only educating Jewish subjects. If you went to, to a Jewish education system in Eastern Europe in the 19th century, if you were male, you only learned Jewish subjects. Girls learned some learned foreign languages, they, um, and they could have more of a secular knowledge of literature or what have you. Didn't matter because either that or they go out to work, so they didn't go to school at all. Uh, but girls generally have more knowledge than boys do. I think we discussed this in the other class uh, last semester. The girls know have a better secular education than boys do until the very late nineteenth century. So if they're only going to be going to the haters and and, and the shiva, they're not learning anything very practical. What work do you learn what your job is? Harriet? They're trying to organize workers to be self conscious as workers uh, and uh, to work and get to the masses of Jews instead of just the masses of peasants, like the Russians do. Also, Jews aren't generally living among Russians, but they won't go into that. Uh, but they do use, they do learn Russian and they use Russian among themselves there as an intellectual language. Okay, and then they come to the United States and they try to also use Russian. But by and large, the, the Jewish unions in the United States don't really use English. They no longer use Russian. They learn to use Yiddish. So that's so the, the language of the bosses 
and the language of the workers is the same language, and it's Yiddish. Harriet? And the leaders were Jewish intellectuals who might come over as Russian speakers, but then eventually they got to be Yiddish to the next people. Uh, and so the Bund is the, the prime example of a Yiddishist organization. Uh, just like the Arbeiter wing, the Brooklyn Circle was created in the 90s, I believe, in this country, um, it was a Yiddish speaking organization for Jewish workers or people who were not. Um, I mean, socialists were generally somewhat secular Jews. Completely secular Jews. Okay. But once they were imbued with Marxist ideology, or you know, the workers of the world unite, uh, then they will try to organize other Jews to become aware of this sort of thing. And so you do get a Jewish working class, a two generation working class in this country and in, in, and in Eastern Europe. And um, so the um but sometimes the and some of the Jewish workers who get consciousness raised in this country what have you uh, like david dubinsky who was the head of the international labor and environment in uh, 1900 he was a jewish worker um and from eastern europe uh and um he, he's working first of all you know, they're in a factory, I guess. It, it's, it's, text, it's garment no matter what. Uh, and eventually he'll go into union leadership from the board because he has his consciousness has been raised and he becomes, well, he was president of the, the founding president of the International Labor Garment Workers Union down in New York. And then he becomes vice president of the AFL. Okay. And the AFL, as I mentioned, was. was by Gompers in the 1880s, but Jews formed their own unions and uh, had Jewish leadership of their unions until eventually they were encompassed within the AFL. Uh, but they were, the, each of the unions uh, tries to organize workers in their field. So if you're a garment workers union, ladies garment workers, okay, the garment industry is divided into ladies' garments and men's garments. So the uh, ladies' garments, international ladies, women's labor union, and the men's garments was originally the United Garment Workers, but then in around 1908 or so or later, uh, this Jewish union breaks up into another, the amalgamated uh, Jewish Workers Union. Um, Garment Workers Union in Chicago, known as the Amalgamated. Okay, so uh, so about a majority of the workers in the I mean, seventy five percent or something like that in New York in the women's garment industry were Jewish. So it's Fifty or sixty percent of the male men's Garments, uh, and they're all broken down, broken down into subsections. Um, we're also Jewish, so the workers are Jewish, the owners are, are just all Jewish, and um, they start out speaking the same language, but eventually are on different sides of the fence. So, but this is all within the Jewish community, both in Eastern York and here. Any questions? I'm, I'm just wondering that with all of the exploitation of workers. Mm -hmm. Did the rabbis ever step in and try to do anything? <coughs> Eventually, when they started to organize and started to have strikes, there was a major, major strike in the women's garment industry in 1909. It was the uprising of the 10,000, 10, 20,000, and anyway, lots of Jewish women workers. They rise up and they go on strike. And um, they don't have too many allies, but they were among the some middle class women's organizations, the Women Trade Union League, 
Mm -hmm. Just on the left. Mm -hmm. okay. They help out, but they're, they're no class. Uh, and some of the other unions will help out. Uh, but in general, as in most strikes in this country in the late 19th and early 20th century, you know, the, uh, the owners bring in strike breakers. And um, particularly brutal in heavy industry, but also in the haymarket stuff, uh, but also in light, uh, in the textiles and the garment industry. Um, but you have these really young girls, I mean, uh, in the 1908 um, strike, there was a girl called Clara Lemlich, and she must have been maybe 18. Okay, and she stood up and she said, "Base workers should unite. We should swear the workers' oath, which was a socialist oath uh, that was comes from you know Eastern Europe." And they got up and swore, and they went out on strike. And they tried to break the strike, and eventually, the some rabbis and other Jewish leaders become involved in trying to settle this strike. They hadn't been involved before, okay, um, to, any, to any degree. I mean, yes, there were certain rabbis like Judah Magnus in New York, um, who was the rabbi of Temple Emmanuel, but he did, and he was a Central European Jew, I think, but he really was very supportive of workers, Jewish workers, uh, even though his congregation was not made up of Jewish workers. Uh, but they tried to mediate this strike. And so in come people like, well, eventually, uh, Brandeis. But before that, it was uh, Louis Marshall, and um, who was the founders of the American Jewish Committee. Um, it was uh, some other labor leaders like Jacob Baron Des, who's Jewish labor leader. Uh, so, but they get together and they or several, you know, they create something that's known as the Protocol of Peace. It was in order to mediate strikes. So you have the rabbis, the uh, Jewish labor leaders, the Jewish owners, somehow are all meeting to agree that they will follow certain procedures, which worked for a couple of years. Um, but then by 1915, World War I, uh, the Union for the United States joins, uh, it breaks down. But they also organized in 1908, while I was at this time period, they also, also organized something called the Tehila in New York. The Tehila community. The same name they used in New York. Many communities. So, uh, so the, the Tehila movement was headed by Judith Magnus. Uh, and, um, Except that during, war, during World War I, it came to a problem because Magnus was a pacifist. Uh, you know, it's funny how things go thing to another. Uh, if you are lenient on labor, you might also be not, be, be not in favor of war, or at least more in favor of war than most other people. So uh, the people didn't so much get involved in labor issues, but they, they got involved in trying to protect the interest of Jews, the public interest of Jews, because in 1908, the police commissioner of New York, by name Bingham, um, he declared that Jews were responsible for, I don't know, 90% of crime in New York City. An exaggerated number. It wasn't true at all. I mean, there were Jews in crime. Sure, immigrant crime is universal. We know it, okay. But the uh, but if the Jews to blame for all the crime in New York City, yeah, we got a problem here. So that's why the leaders, the, the, the German Jewish leaders, the uptown Jews, and the downtown Jews try to get together and uh, organize things to make to, to clean up the Jewish community so that they won't be involved in so many criminal activities or at least not supporting it. I mean, there was a whole Jewish mafia in New York. I don't know if you know, if you know the story of, uh, uh, well, Meyer Lansky's probably one of the most famous ones, but 
they were a bunch of others. Um, and um, there's a book called um, a Book on Jewish Crime, written by Janet Jocelyn. Um, it's called Our Game or something. I don't remember the name. And anyway, um, they, you know, there was something called Murder Incorporated. No. Yeah, and that's what it was. Murder Incorporated. It was the Mafia, <laughs> except that it was a Jewish Mafia. Uh, so Jews were accused of you know, being responsible for crimes, and they started trying to clean that up. There was also all kinds of feuds within the kosher food industry. Uh, and uh, kosher meat prices kept on going up. I think I mentioned last week there was a strike of Jewish women, why housewives, when um, boycotted the the, uh, the butchers in New York, um, and uh, eventually they managed to get the price of kosher meat down. But enough of them boycotted it that they lost business, and because it was New York, it could make a significant difference one way or the other. So. Okay, so all the, so the, all the, and there was also a, it was the beginning of organized Jewish education, the Board of Jewish Education comes out of this, also the beginning of federations, well not quite the beginning of federations, federations began way before this, but Jews, the Jews are getting together and sort of federating in certain ways so that they could deal with problems more effectively than they did it before. Uh, and the Kahila exists from 1908 to 1922. Uh, the main author of the book on Kahila is uh, Arthur Gorin. I mean, the name of the book. Anyway, uh, he, he, he's been in Israel for many years now, but he's from New York. And um, so there was, so the Kahila experiment was trying to create a sort of a united Jewish community with uptown and downtown, people working together, and to some degree, it, Succeeded in certain respects, um, and uh, but it broke down in the twenties. Uh, but the the protocol for the book of peace, which was Brandeis was eventually the author of it. Uh, this was supposed to mediate strikes. Jewish law often works through mediation. Uh, Jewish court mediates, um, and. So that's, uh, so they use those principles in order to make peace in the garment industry, but also in, in other areas. And um, it's sort of on the basis of Jewish law that Jews, that, that you could get Jews to communicate with each other. Uh, and the idea of you know, social action and tikkun olam and all of these things, would, you know, this was part of of leftist Judaism in Europe, like leftist socialism, not Judaism, socialism, uh, so that when these, these new socialists come over and they become the labor leaders in this country, some of them remain radical, okay, in which case they're anarchists like Anna Golden, or Emma Golden, Emma Golden, uh, who was a, um, uh, an anarchist, uh, and um, Eventually, I mean, I don't know if you remember the movie not too long ago, uh, Rag, Ragtime, with the Golden. And she was real. Uh, and, uh, and she she frowned on everything, anything bourgeois, including marriage, uh, because she saw how marriage exploited women. That's what the feminist movement, what the book of women's movement, dealt with. Uh, that marriage wasn't a solution to everything, which caused the problem, problem all kinds of problems. Anyhow, so Emma Goldman was a good anarchist. Yeah, but there were also Jewish women in, who were progressives, Jewish men who were progressives, i.e. the progressives in those days were the Republicans. Oh, at that time, yeah. At that time, you know, the yeah. progressives were Republicans. The party of the party of the party. But, yes. Yeah, well, you know, in, Ca in Canada, you still have progressive conservatives. Okay. Not necessarily very progressive, they are right wing, but the progressives in the early 20th century were the 
opposition to Tammany Hall, which controlled New York politics. Now, the Jews in New York, to begin with, were socialists, at least on the Lower East Side. Not all the Jews. I mean, there were some Jewish Republicans, okay? Uh, and there were some Jews involved in Tammany Hall, okay? Uh, but the progressives were trying to reform society, to introduce legislation to protect workers, and, um, and also, it's women progressives who established the um, settlement houses in New York, in Chicago, Hull House, uh, which was uh, Jane Adams, and Henry, the Henry Street Settlement, which was Lillian Wald, who was a Jewish nurse. First, she was organizing Jewish nurses to help the Jewish community, and then she sets up a settlement, now a Jewish settlement. Uh, now, what is a settlement house? It provides all sorts of services for an usually immigrant community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An immigrant community, often for the girls in the immigrant community, and for the women. And they were also the Jewish Educational Alliance is created in those, in, in its areas, and they provided educational opportunities and social places for Jews to get together. So, uh, the night classes, often those were for girls who worked or for uh, women who worked uh, or went at home who wanted some kind of, who wanted to learn English, if they could afford time to do it, they would go to the Educational Alliance to have, to take classes. Uh, and they had all kinds of different classes and uh, also create a place in the uh, settlement home houses. They would get a place for kids to go after school. Uh, and they, it, we always had it's a pretty rough neighborhood. And there was a lot of tension between Jews and non Jews. Uh, Jews don't get along terribly well with the Irish, but most of the Irish were moving out of railway at that, 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 that time. And the, the, the German, the German Germans, often moved out of the railway side just you know, before the Jews got there, or just after the Jews started to come. Uh, but but then, you know, the other immigrants who come in in the late 19th century are Slavic immigrants and Italian immigrants. Jews and Italians, as we know, they get along just fine. Not encouraged to marry each other, but up until everything but, okay, <laughs> they still live together in Brooklyn. They get along very nicely. Uh, Jews and Poles, however, not so good. Uh, so, and you know, a lot of Jewish kids learned how to fight because they had to. Uh, but the, so this was a place where, where, where people could go to learn skills that were not being taught in school. Uh, and uh, it was safe places where they could go after school. Uh, if they went to school, or after work. work. Uh, the so this was a this was a a chance for women to help other women and children basically that's what this so philanthropy women's philanthropy in the nineteenth century in the twentieth century was women helping other women and that's true for Jewish women's organizations uh, I think I talked last week about the National Council of Jewish Women. We would help other women, help immigrants. Also set up classes for women. Hadassah does this too. Uh, not so, Hadassah doesn't work so much with immigrants, but they do work with educating their members in Jewish education. They always did that from the beginning. So did the National Council for Jewish Women. The National Council for Jewish Women was, was an organization for reformed Jewish women. They're German Jewish. Yeah, they came early. Hadassah is primarily, the Zionist movement, primarily for Eastern European Jews, who now know English. Because Hadassah never, as far as I know, was founded in 1912. As far as I know, they never did very much in Yiddish. Now, pioneer women knew Yiddish, that they were uh, actually not now called Naaman, but pioneer women was founded in the 1920s uh, for Jewish women who were uh, ladies left wing Zionists. 
Um, and um, they used Yiddish. And um, to begin with, Golda Meir, who comes of a Jewish labor background, in Eastern Europe, then, especially in the United States, um, she always, she, she, I don't think she really functioned too much in Yiddish. Basically, she was English, but then not English. Uh, but at any rate, uh, often the women said, well, I have organizations help other women, and they can be associated with any branch of uh, Judaism or Jewish life. Um, right. Yeah. This, any of those organizations um, help settle women in other cities other than New York, like Philadelphia? Oh, every, every city has these same organizations. The National Council of Jewish Women is national. It was originally founded in Chicago at the World's Fair in 1892. Yeah. And uh, it's, they had a Jewish pavilion. I mean, sorry, a women's pavilion. Jewish pavilion. Anyhow, that's where, where the National Council of Jewish Women gets to start. Okay. And uh, they were, you know, but originally those people were German Jews, Lady Bountiful, Ladies Bountiful, I guess, who would go into uh, the what, slums, ghettos, whatever you want to call them. Today we call them ghettos, but in those days they were just slums. Uh, and they would teach other Eastern, Eastern European women, mainly Jews in this case, you know, how to keep house and how to look after them, how to be cleaner and how to, uh, I don't imagine they were always that welcome into immigrant homes because they would teach, often teaching women things that they didn't need to learn. They would have loved to be able to keep clean all the time and to keep their apartments clean and yeah, and they knew how to cook. <laughs> but you get things coming out of settlement houses like the settlement cookbook comes out of Milwaukee. 1903 Milwaukee, and it, I don't know. I have a settlement cookbook. I kind of had it as a wedding present. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The shower present. Okay. I, actually, I am finally parting from my settlement cookbook. I have put it on a pile of things to get rid of and maybe to sell at local. Is that the one that weighed to a man's heart? Is, is it was his stomach? Yes. It says that in the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it is. And it is for immigrant women. And it's created by a settlement house. And many of the recipes are immigrant recipes. So there are lots of Jewish recipes in there. Although my favorite recipe to use that, to, to, that I used from that cookbook, um, except I copied it out so I can use it without the cookbook, uh, is sweet and sour pork made out of left, leftover meat. <laughs> Works very well. <laughs> with other kinds of meat. But, <laughs> but that title of the recipe is Sweet Sour Pork. Oh. So it wasn't a kosher cookbook by any means. Oh. Uh, but oh. it was a settlement cookbook. And um, very basic. I never realized that that's, I mean, I knew the name, I never realized that it came from the settlement. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like that. That's interesting. But it's not New York, it's, it's Milwaukee. Ah. Oh, so, uh, yeah, it's really a uh, history of Jewish food is really kind of interesting. And there's lots of stuff now being written on that, but I'm not teaching it here. Uh, but I'm reading a very interesting book on Jewish food over the, over the years. However, where was I before I got into food? I don't always eat food, but um, uh, the, you know, and what is called, you know, what becomes known as Jewish food in this country, so they're talking about immigrants. Huh? Jewish food in this country. How Jewish is it? <laughs> Jewish from the areas Eastern where they were from in Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Jewish cooking is a adaptations of the different cuisines where people came. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. of course. Yeah. So you know, you felt the fish. I'm sure they weren't the only people to make it, but they probably only used they used kosher fish. I don't know what they called it, and bagels, Polish. <laughs> I'll take credit for it. They should. It's a Polish, a Polish going where the Jews got into it. Bialis. Polox is Swedish, you know. Yeah. Area. Uh, Northern Europe. Northern Europe. Yeah. Uh, smoked salmon, yes. Uh huh. Uh, and um, Denmark's got wonderful, wonderful herring and oh, smoked oh. salmon. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I mean, that's Scandinavian, but they're not that many Scandinavian Jews. So it became, you know, Northern European cook cooking, especially Eastern European cooking. Uh, Jews share food with their neighbors, but they adapted to kosher, to, to becoming kosher. Uh, now, Jews don't necessarily share food with their neighbors because they're Jews in the keeping kosher, but they certainly are influenced by the food around them. And uh, you can trace this sort of thing back to the ancient world and up to the present, which is what this book I'm reading, and I got to essays that were written by my son. Um, but uh, anyway, I started reading it again, uh, and I'm talking to it. But Jewish food, it's called Jewish because that's what Jews ate when they came, they brought it with them. Okay? But it is not really Jewish. Because you, you speak when you were in Israel. I mean, there are different kinds of Jews in Israel, and they eat different kinds of food. And for and for Mizrahi Jews, to fill the fish is very alien. Mm. They might make uh, sukkaniyot, and they certainly eat falafel, and that's become Israeli. But, Trademark. Uh, but of course, falafel is shared by Arab countries all around. They claim it too. Not that different, it's the same stuff. Uh, and Israeli salads, well, they just eat the same thing. But Ashkenazi Jews were not used to eating. They, they were used to, they were used to, you know, chopped liver and uh, all these things that are seen as Jewish foods. <laughs> but they're not Jewish. They're Ashkenazi. <laughs> when I first moved to this area, somebody mentioned to me that Jewish apple cake. And I never knew I never, that, Jewish I never knew that apple cakes had religions, you know. <laughs> in New York it was just an apple cake. Yeah. But they were sure that because I was Jewish I would know how to make oh, yeah. Jewish. <laughs> yeah, I still have I still don't have a good recipe for Jewish apple cake. I, I have, have a lot of share with you. I guess I could have eaten it. <laughs> given, given to me by a non-Jew. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, what makes it a Jewish apple Exactly, it's just yeah. an apple no, cake. I, you know. it's like, well, but in Philadelphia, they say Jewish apple cake. And in New York, it's, it, it's an apple cake that Jewish women bring yeah. out to make, and they share their other Jewish women. Yeah. 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 It's an apple cake that Jewish women bring out to make, and they share their other Jewish women who bring out to make Jewish apple cake. There's nothing Jewish about the apple cake. <laughs> and it's not religious, it's cultural. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. That's how Jews become American. They start eating the food of their neighbors. And the settlement cookbook helps them to do it because there are all kinds of recipes in there. Uh, but there is a fairly large number of, Jew of books from Jewish cooks uh, because they, collect, they, they collected recipes from the people who came to the settlement house. And they published it. And can I point out that you were the editor of one of the Bethel cookbooks, you put, you know, remember you put that together? Uh, you, there was an index in the back, and we had to send it back because they put, um, the, the company added um, pork and ham. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Do you remember oh, that? Oh, you were involved oh, with it. Yes, you oh, were. Oh, <laughs> years ago. Which one? The, the second? The, the, I don't remember which, which number it was. I think it's the, because the gray one is the old one. Right. right, and then there is the shiny one, the light, yeah. and I am giving away my copy of that too. But I'm giving it to Phyllis uh, Schachter because she wanted a copy. Come on, I want to interrupt, but oh, oh, we're done. All good. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually. I remember the about labor. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about the seven and a half cents. Okay, seven and a half. It's done by Avila. The, the, uh, the